Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m. and serves as the City's policy-making and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the council's deliberative process. The chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at www.siouxfalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting www.siouxfalls.org slash council or by calling the council office at 605-367 8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. It is Tuesday, October 11th. Uh, we'll start our meeting by introducing you to your city council. Council member Starr. Here. Staley. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Kiley. Here. Neitzert. Present. Rolfing. Here. Selberg. Here. Councilors, thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, in Sioux Falls, we lead our city council meetings with an invocation. Very, very uh, pleased to have Pastor Brian Narkomy here with the Center of Hope. Pastor, welcome. Good to have you here. What we'd ask you to do is to stand for the invocation and then remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor Brian. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, I thank you for another day of life. Father, I pray that you be with Mary Huther, be with all the council members. I ask that you be with all of our, all of our elders be with the families that are represented here. Father, we ask that you just give them the guidance and the strength, the understanding that they need to make these decisions. Father, I thank you. I pray and ask this always. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Council, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to our consent agenda. Any motions, changes, discussions? Move for approval. Second, Urban Buck. Thank you. Councilor uh, uh, Vice Chair Kiley has made a motion to approve those uh, consent agenda items. Second by Councilor Urban Bach. If there is no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Urban Bach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Our regular agenda tonight. Uh, any changes or motions to that, please? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Kylie. Council Chair Rolfing has made a motion to approve our regular agenda. Seconded by Council Vice Chair Rolfing, or Kylie, sorry. Uh, if there is no changes, no discussion, a roll call vote, please. 
Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Councilor, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, uh, public input uh, portion of our meeting tonight. I'd like to welcome everybody here. If you'd like to speak to the council on any topic whatsoever, please just come forward. And uh, really two things we'd ask. Number one, if you could just introduce yourself to the people of Sioux Falls. And then number two, please keep your comments to five minutes or less. Welcome. Hi. Mr. Mayor? Yes. If you could do me a favor and just let me know when we're about four minutes and 30 seconds with a Got hand it. raise or something. Be happy to. Um, and if I don't finish, I'll come back next week. I want to talk to you folks about the mutual aid agreement. And, and um, if you could just introduce yourself, please. Excuse me. Um, I'm sure nobody in the room knows who I am. I am Jay Major, MedStar Paramedic Ambulance CEO and President um, on the ambulance service in Brandon and, and in the county here. We've been, uh, I've been in this area since 19, well, my whole life, but in the ambulance business since 1988. And I think I'm the last one standing from those days. But, um, you know, we have to take this and what we have to do is we have to not look at personalities when, when we're talking about ambulance care. And we have to look at uh, what's best for the population, not what's best for MedStar, for REMSA, for the city, for Paramedics Plus. You have to look at what's best for the people. And you ask why I haven't signed the mutual aid agreement yet. And I watched the last, uh, uh, when they were here just getting their 3% raise, I watched that all and I got a little uh, irritated by that because I was in communication with them and I didn't know that they were going to throw me under the bus such as the way they did. First off, REMSA, it's not a volunteer group, it's paid. Joe Franken runs REMSA. Julie Charbonneau is, is, a, is a health director. She's part of the health department. They've got some volunteers on that REMSA board. But ultimately, Mr. Mayor, you're in charge of REMSA. You're in charge of Joe Franken. You're in charge of Julie Charbonneau. You're in charge of REMSA. Okay, so MedStar approached Paramedics Plus over a year ago when they first began service. And I asked them, begged them for a mutual aid agreement. And I was told no. And I'm not going to get into it um, because I don't have time here in five minutes. I was told no. And I was told no because REMSA said they didn't want me to mutual aid with them. But they did get one with Del Rapids back then. So a year later, it comes out, which has been happening all year long, these time response issues are not new. And shame on Jill Franken for telling that gal on KELO she was a liar for driving her own kid into the hospital. You don't call people liars, you try and correct the situation the best you know how. And I've been working with P Plus trying to do that, and I've also asked REMSA to meet with me, which they obviously refused to do. So I'm standing here in front of you today not because I make any money coming into this town. I don't. I've been called into this town over 20 times, and out of that 20 times, the only transport that I have gotten, the only time I made it to the scene, is a cardiac arrest, which in which we helped the police department, the sheriff's department, and the fire department, and we saved that gal's life. You haven't heard that from anybody, have you? That was MedStar in Sioux Falls, saved the life. That's the only time we've made it to a call. Otherwise, what we've been used for is to call us from Brandon. We start heading towards Sioux Falls. Once we get here, we could be three minutes from the call, from the scene, and a P plus unit will come available on a hospital. They could be 10 minutes away. They call us off and they send them. Their time response, time response started at that point. That's how you fluff with numbers, guys. There's number fluffing here going on. There's also with the Sioux Falls Fire Department not being able to respond to priority three calls now. That's so they don't know what's going on. It's pretty simple. I look at you counselors as smart people. I don't say, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm doing because you're stupid and you should listen to me because you're not in this field. And, and it, it offended me when I hear people say that to you. And I, don't, I, and I think it's absolutely wrong. You're not stupid people. You are people that have a right to go out there and know what's going on in this city with your ambulance service, with your fire department. You should be able to ask questions. You should be able to sit in on meetings and you should be able to ask your health director what's going on and she should absolutely be responsible to tell you an answer when you ask her a question. Not, you guys are too dumb to understand. So, the reason that we talked about a, a little bit of subsidy coming into the city, my job is not a backup to Paramedics Plus. My job isn't to come in here, save the response time, let them take the call, and absorb me staffing another truck out in that area while they're taking that patient. That's not my job. My job is for patient care. So 
I want to be able to continue to do that in the county and in the city of Brandon. But also, guys, let's get rid of the silly attitude that because we had dis a disagreement a year and a half ago, which we probably still would right now if I could afford to fund what I was doing, it's over. I lost. You won. Okay? 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I lost. You won. Let's just put it that way. But now let's all win. Let's take all the things that we've learned through the so many years that we've been doing this together and do something with it. MedStar is not a dirty word. It's a great word. We've got a four-minute response time in Brandon and a little higher in the county. That's because I spend money, and that's because I have people waiting there to take calls. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. I will uh, I'll finish uh, this next week. Jay, thank you as well. Appreciate right. it. Make it a great night. Welcome. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, I assume that this is a, uh, uh, he's got a story to tell and that he'll show the respect he needs uh, to the council after, and by removing the hat when he's done telling his story. Mr. There Daly. must be a prop. You're out of line, Counselor. Mr. Daly, go ahead, sir. Dan Daly, Sioux Falls. There's no dress code for council meetings. A counselor who orders someone to remove an article of clothing is outside his authority. You wear $1,000 suits, I wear hats. I remove my hat for the pledge and for the prayer. I'll not remove it for the council. City government has been proven with court cases not to be constitutional or democratic. You ignore findings of facts and conclusions of law. You recently denied a vote. Your form of government doesn't deserve citizen respect. The mayor insists the council silent during public comment. You must refrain from abusive harassment or contemptible reactions. It's an ethics issue worthy of a hearing, unless, of course, you always vote with the mayor. There's been obvious bullying and sexist behavior. Save it for private. You humiliated one citizen who came to report some sand in his front yard. It took courage for him to come before the council, and you caned him. There's council humor about the problem five. Please define this group. I hope it's not LGBT discrimination. Consider me number six. I'm sure there's no application form but if there is, I'd like 6,400 copies. There's a division between citizens and the monarchy. It's either side of this three-foot wall. Mr. Huther, tear down this wall. Thank you. Folks, is there anybody else who wanted to engage the council? Welcome. Sorry, <laughs> Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. Oh boy, I don't even know how to follow that. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so I went out to uh, the uh, Empire Mall this weekend and I observed the, uh, the snow plows and I found an issue with one of them. Uh, Finding Jesus was on one of them. And I thought that we had solved this problem a few years ago, not by the disclaimers, but I thought the Public Works Department was going to implement a policy that said we we're going to discourage you from promoting any religion, not just Christianity, any religion on government-owned property. Now, the separation clause is there for a reason. It's there to protect people who are religious, Mayor. It's not there to just protect people who are not religious. It is there to protect them. Many great societies immigrated to this country. Why? They came here because they were being persecuted in their countries over their religion and were told they had to worship a certain God. And they didn't like it, so they came here. The ir irony of this is that it's the same school that decided to paint this on their plow, basically thumbing the nose at, at taxpayers. So I, I ask you this, what if, what if a government official, what if you, Mike, or, or 
someone from the health department walked in to the Lutheran school and said, we don't like your curriculum because it has Jesus in it. We need you to stop teaching that. You know what they tell you to do? They tell you to get the heck out of their building. Why? Because separation of church and state. What an amazing thing. But they think it's okay to paint on these plows. And now, this isn't the first time it's happened. That's why I'm bringing this up. I thought this was taken care of. I thought the public works department said, we're going to have a policy from now on. It's okay to display faith and spirituality and paint whatever. You know, Christ the King, that's a school, so that's not really displaying religion. We didn't do that. We didn't learn a thing from this a couple years ago. All the publicity, all the media, uh, the attorneys that were going to get involved with this, we learned nothing. Separation of church and state has been around for a long time. The Supreme Court has upheld it. But for some reason in Sioux Falls, we think we're smarter than that. I'm going to say it again. It is there to protect you. It is there to protect Christians, Jews, Muslims, whatever. It is there so that government doesn't tell you how to worship. And in turn, we ask that you don't tell us how to worship. Obviously, it's probably not going to get painted over. You know, it's just Scott blabbing about whatever. But I, I wish it would. As for the smoking ban, um, had many conversations with people with this. I think it should be amended. I'm okay with the parks and the, the bike trail. And the main reason I'm okay with that is because I don't like the litter of cigarette butts. And they sh people shouldn't be littering our parks with cigarette butts. But with the event center, we have an interesting issue there. And, and here's what it is. We sell alcohol at the event center. We make money from it. Well, Ovations makes money from it. We're actually building more beer coolers because we don't have enough beer cooler space. Alcohol kills probably as many people as tobacco does. And guess what? Both products are legal as long as you're an adult. So isn't it a little hypocritical for us to say we're not going to allow people to smoke, but we're going we're to make money and allow people to drink alcohol at the event center? So I say, if you want to ban cigarettes outside of the event center, fine ban alcohol. Well, that's not going to go over. So I would say the parks are great, but at the event center, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't touch that with the 10 foot pole. And lastly, I listened to the discussion of the glory house. And, and, and I want to say that I think gifting that piece of junk building to them is a wonderful idea. And there are questions about, you know, the value of it and, and what we need, you know, you know, should we just give it to them? And I've talked about this at length before. But you have to remember something. This city gives millions of dollars a year towards special interest sports clubs that do nothing for people who are trying to stay out of jail and trying to get their lives put back together. Scott, this would be a great you, humanitarian Scott. effort. So please gift the building. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Welcome, David. Greetings. I take it I'm kind of famous for that gesture. <laughs> Gre greetings. Well, okay. Now, I'm a, a bit of a scientist and engineer by trade and by training, and I like to understand how things work. So one way to understand how things work is you make a model, a, a theoretical and empirical model. So I want to understand our government not, not just in Sioux Falls, you know, the, the, whole, the, the whole government, and trying to understand how it works. And if you understand how it works, then maybe we can make it better. Now, if you've followed the current election at all, you can tell there's a lot of unhappy people out there in our country. So something needs to give. We need to figure out what's going on. In a democracy, elections are like the big deal. That's what changes everything. 
And if you can control the elections, you can control the government. And if you can control the government, you can control laws and the world. Pretty cool. That's how it goes. Now, in our culture, advertising is really important in elections. If you have more money, better funded campaign, you get more ads, more votes. But on the downside, you know, if you're some poor schmuck, no rich friends, no money, no chance. All right, so important thing here is that uh, elections are expensive. You need some rich banker, rich, rich bank, bankers. And corporations, man, budgets on elections out of this world. And there's a few rich families who spend about a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. With elections, ex with expensive elections, if you're running for especially state or national office, you're kind of stuck as a politician because you have to seek the favor of these rich donors. Now that's a real problem. If, uh, if you're having to chase campaign funds all the time, you're always looking for how does this decision affect these people who might contribute to my campaign? And then, as soon as that happens, the people, we don't do so very well. And if you think about that for too long at all, you might think that, oh my gosh, we're going to get systemic corruption just due to campaign finance being so thoroughly skewed in favor of very rich people. Now, I did say it's very difficult to maintain integrity under these conditions, so that means it's still humanly possible, but you know, it's hard, and if we could change campaign finance, we might be able to change quite a bit. Now, if you look around in South Dakota, say, I think we, might, we have a regressive tax structure where poor people pay a greater percentage of their income in taxes than rich people. We've got stuff like payday loans that have 300% interest rates, and somebody benefits from this, and it's not the poor people. It's probably people who finance somebody's elections. Oh, and if you think about mm, screwed up elections, it explains lots of other stuff, like oh, loss of rights for the peasants and more power for the rich. Anyway, there's a big list of stuff that, exp that, that is explained quite nicely by this short little model I have of modern American government. And just because things are bad doesn't mean they have to stay that way. As usual, you know, I don't just go and complain about this and complain about that. I make recommendations. Now, as a nation, if we could change the rules of campaign finance, we would change the world. Because then, you know, state and national politicians wouldn't be stuck chasing after campaign funds. They'd be more free to listen to us people. So anyway, hey, I got 30 seconds. And I'd like to bid you all a good evening, and there we go. That's my talk for the night. Good night, David. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Good evening. My name is Tom Wilford. Hi, Tom. I am uh, from Marv Sanitary Service in Brandon. I am uh, attempting to reflect the, um, the views of the majority of uh, garbage haulers in the uh, Garbage Haulers Association uh, of, in this area. I'd like to direct my comments towards the proposed ordinance change uh, requiring some sort of financial assurance be provided to the city uh, in the case of a hauler's bill going unpaid or to protect the city in the case of a hauler's bill going unpaid. Uh, you may not be surprised that most, if not all, of the haulers are opposed to this. We believe uh, this would never become an issue without the uh, uh, very regrettable situation where a garbage haulers bill um, several years ago was allowed to uh, to uh, grow to the tune of uh, 250 some thousand dollars. Uh, his bill, uh, his monthly bill, could not have been um, anywhere near what this uh, ballooned into, and. Uh, what he would have ended up owing the city would have been a small fraction of that uh, 250 some thousand if he would have been denied access to the landfill according to the provisions of the existing code. 
uh, which was in force at that time and is uh, still. I don't know, I suspect the landfill has had few, if any other haulers who have uh, not paid up on, on a past due account. Most of us here have decades of history uh, with the landfill. We've paid our bills regularly and have had no issue uh, with the landfill. We have a hard time accepting the idea that we should have now have to buy a bond or provide some other uh, assurance that we won't uh, leave our bills unpaid. We feel that uh, we are being punished for the mistakes of others uh, by this proposal. Uh, why should we add yet another expense line uh, when the landfill has no reason, based on our history, uh, to think that we won't pay our bills as we have always paid them in the past? To make us the target of an ordinance concerning unpaid landfill bills just doesn't uh, sit well. Uh, the cost of a bond uh, could range from $1,500 for a small hauler to as much as $10,000, uh, according to Diane Best in the Argus Leader. We simply can't agree to paying a few thousand dollars when we have done nothing wrong. It's just not justified. The landfill uh, should deal directly with the delinquent hauler should that situation arise in the future, but continue the good faith relationship that has existed for many, many years with haulers who have proven that they value the opportunity to have a charge account at the landfill. There's another ordinance that is, uh, is up for consideration as well, and that has to do with uh, in, uh, inspections of our trucks. And with that comes another cost, and small costs add up to undeniably large costs, costs that have to be dealt with somehow. And as businessmen, part of our job is to, is to uh, maintain costs, and especially to eliminate costs that are needless. Um, the thing with the um, cost of vehicle inspections is there's, there's a, an element of, of payback. There's an element of investment there because we do gain something from that. That's not just money gone. Uh, we have another set of eyes looking at our equipment. And uh, you know we may find out that uh, or have it confirmed that we're their maintenance program that we have in place is is doing the job and uh, Taking care of all the aspects uh, that need to be um, Cared for in a truck and keeping it safe or uh, It may bring to our attention something that we've overlooked or some particular item that we missed the last time around so there is a payback um, To us for that expense, you know, so it's not all uh, unjustifiable but when we have to write a check for a bond, that money is gone. That, that money is absolutely gone. It will do absolutely, it will do us absolutely no good because it's simply gone. We get no payback for that at all. Thank you for your uh, consideration of our point of view. Tom, thank you as well, sir. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Kurt Froning. I represent Novak Sanitary here in Sioux Falls. Um, I echo some of my colleague Tom's uh, remarks in regards to uh, the bond that's being, some of the, um, the bond that's being proposed. Um, we have a, our company has a reputation for over 50 years now of doing business here in the Sioux Falls community, doing business with the Sioux Falls uh, landfill. Uh, and in that time, uh, all of our bills have been paid in a timely fashion. Um, we, there seems to be a situation now where the city has allowed uh, perhaps some haulers to go beyond uh, what they were able to pay and has allowed them to continue incurring more and more debt prior to making them stop and making responsible decisions about how they ran their business. Uh, it seems as if now um, this, this uh, responsibility is being placed on us as the haulers and incurring, as has been mentioned, a cost to do that. Um, for a company our size, um, our uh, landfill bills 
total into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So as you can imagine, a bond for us is going to total into the tens of thousands of dollars uh, for us to be able to do that. And all the while, we've done nothing more than pay our bills on time each and every month. Um, and we don't see that uh, it should become our responsibility uh, to look out for and, in effect, be the watchdog for those who aren't paying their bills on time. Um, at one of our information sessions, we found out that the city does have uh, software capable now of monitoring uh, haulers' accounts and knowing who's gone past due, who's become delinquent. We would ask that they would you know, use that as a means to monitor the traffic and who's paying their bills and who isn't. Um, and we feel that, again, it's, it's just unfair to pass that cost on to all of those of us who uh, do pay our bills on time. Rather, uh, why not make the target those that don't uh, pay their bills on time? You know, as a company here in Sioux Falls, um, we're required to monitor all of our customer accounts. And when our customers go beyond due, go 30 days, 60 days, 90 days past due, we make a decision about what we're going to do about it. We do not require everybody who signs up to get their trash hauled purchase a bond to ensure they're going to pay their bill. Uh, we don't do that for the city, and we don't do that for any of our customers that, that we work with um, because we don't feel it's good business, and we don't feel it's good business for the city to be requiring that of us as well. Um, one of the other uh, ordinances that's being proposed tonight is about inspections, um, and we do applaud the uh, this ordinance. We think it's a good ordinance to make sure that the trucks that are rolling down the streets in Sioux Falls are safe. Uh, requiring a DOT level inspection we feel is, is an important thing to ensure the safety of our citizens and this is this is one that we certainly do support so we thank you for that. Uh, but again, we would ask that uh, this surety bond uh, be uh, something that's not required of, of those of us who are continuing to pay our bills on time. Kurt, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll now move on to item number five, please. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 57 of the Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to garbage and construction and demolition haulers. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, just a very brief overview of the landfill. We did present this. Uh, introduce yourself to the people of our town, please. Sorry, Dustin Hanson, landfill superintendent. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, like I said, we, we gave a brief presentation last week and informational uh, about the ordinance changes we're bringing forward tonight. Uh, just a, a brief one. Five county area, 260,000 tons per year. We have two landfills, MSW and a C&D landfill. Uh, tipping fees for MSW are currently $37 per ton. C&D is $34 per ton. These tipping fees will not change for the next three years. Um, we have 21 licensed MSW haulers um, and then four more that haul strictly C&D waste. Uh, chapter 57 uh, regulates the landfill, commercial haulers, uh, recycling standards, and the Solid Waste Planning Board. Uh, we have a process that we go through. We, like I said, we have a solid waste planning board, and with that, we have an ordinance review subcommittee. Um, these ordinances, this ordinance was brought to the solid waste planning board, uh, then to an industry meeting with the haulers and recyclers in Sioux Falls, and it was voted on to bring to council July 26th with a six to four vote. Construction and demolition waste haulers, uh, they haul your carpet wood, construction plastic shingles from new construction, uh, remodels, things of that nature. This would require um, all commercial construction and demolition waste haulers to be licensed. Uh, there was some confusion um, with the MSW haulers. We also license uh, medical waste haulers, transfer stations, and recycling facilities. So this would add them into that. Um, and just to note that uh, we do permit each unit. It's a $25 fee per year. Uh, with this, if you're hauling strictly just C&D waste, you just haul, pay a $25 fee once for that roll-off container. And like I said, again, this would remove existing language that was confusing um, previously. This is slated for second reading at, uh, next week, and we'd ask you uh, to keep that on the agenda. With that, we'll take any questions. Dustin, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, this is a first reading, so you don't have an opportunity to engage the council just yet. 
But uh, councillors, any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Councillor Erickson. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I do have um, a couple of questions. I, I did have some clarification earlier um, tonight, but my question is, is what, where did these changes come from? I mean, I know a little bit of the background, but tell me, did you compare yourself to Sioux City, Omaha, Lincoln, Rapid City, or was this just something that was done collaborative, collaborative amongst the Solid Waste Board? Yeah, we, we looked at several uh, municipalities across the country. Some, some do licensing dollars, some don't. Um, we saw it would be a best practice for us and to help better uh, police our landfill. We're getting more and more requests from uh, companies that wanted to come into Sioux Falls and start a C&D uh, recycler uh, hauling business. Um, just this year alone, we've had six requests uh, to open that. It's just to help us strengthen um, that policy, those policies, uh, we have a lot of trucks on the streets, a lot of roll-off containers on the streets. That way we can permit them um, as well as when they come to the landfill. Right now, we do not have to save their tear weights, so it makes it more efficient uh, for the haulers um, and more efficient for the landfill. Okay. Dustin, uh, Councilor Erickson asked if there were any uh, local um, benchmarking done. You said you did nationwide. Were there any that were in this area? No, we, we did not see any, no. And I, I do have a couple other questions, but I know that they're all, I mean, we have three different ordinances all on the same topic. Um, so that question I will carry over to the other two um, items as well. Um, and I'll wait for my other questions then because they're pertaining to the other ones in more detail. Councilor Erickson, thank you. Councilor Staley? Um, I, I just had a technical question as I was looking. We had the presentation last week, and being new on the council, I, I remember when we had the Chapter 39 issue, uh, you weren't involved with that, but the HR thing on transgender and, and campaign finance, and that was all packaged together, and then we, we to address one of those parts, we had to do an amendment. And I was wondering why these were put into three different ordinances when they're still they're out of the same involving the same chapter and the same really topic. Uh, that was just a, a choice that we made to bring them separately. Uh, they were, a couple of them were introduced uh, initially and then we added on the uh, bond and insurance later. Okay, thank you. Diane, would you be able to provide a, uh, not that that was a bad answer, Dustin, but is there, is there a rationale to separate the three? Uh, actually, they started out with the Solid Waste Planning Board, a couple of them uh, at different times, as I recall, but then also uh, the city requirement is, is that you have one topic for each ordinance. And so it's, they're all landfill ordinances, but one applies to safety inspections, one applies to C&D licensing, and the other applies to financial insurance, assurance and insurance, so risk. Does that so help? three Council different Stanley. topics. But then why, why weren't those separated out when we dealt with that Chapter 39 issue? Councilor Seed, I can. Lots of pieces in that one as well. I can't answer that, but I think that uh, to your question in terms of this one here, I think uh, Diane did a pretty good job answering that. Uh, David, I don't know if we can go back. No, I wouldn't think so. Councilor Seed, did that help? Thank you. No, good job. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Neissert. Dustin, I think you touched on this a little bit, but could you explain what the $25 fee um, is used for? What does it provide? Yep, the $25 will uh, purchase a permit that goes on their hauling unit, and then that way we can put that number into our computer software, and that's how we can track uh, their loads and their tear weights um, at the landfill. Is there, inspection, is there an inspection you do at the time that goes with that $25 today or not? Yeah, we typically do a visual inspection. Uh, we reserve the right to do random inspections at the landfill for those units. What does what a visual inspection entail? Uh, usually visual inspection is if it's a leak-proof container, um, if it's depending on what the unit is, if it's a truck, if the headlights work, uh, windshield wiper, fire extinguisher, things of that nature. Okay, thank you. Councilors, would anybody want to set a dating and hearing and second reading for Monday, October 17th of this item? I'll move that. Councilor Chair, thank you. Second, Star. Councilor Star, thank you as well. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erfenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. 
Councillor Sankey, that is passed eight to zero. Item six, please. First reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending chapter 57, garbage and recycling, subchapter sanitary landfill of the code of ordinances of the city pertaining to vehicle inspections. Thank you. Um, vehicle inspections, so like I said previously, the landfill currently can randomly inspect vehicles and that's for what is in the load, uh, the actual the leak proof of the, of the container. Uh, this one we brought forward because we've had numerous complaints on our streets of leaking fluids, uh, things of that nature. Um, so this one would require each commercial hauler to get a DOT inspection um, and we chose the DOT inspection because it was a, a uniform inspection. Uh, there's already probably over half of the vehicles already being required to have this inspection, um, but this would uh, just help and help strengthen our safety of our streets. We have a lot of haulers that go down our streets um, at any given one time. So, Dustin, would you mind answering uh, Councilor Erickson's question in regards to this one too? Was there benchmarking done nationwide or locally? Yeah. Uh, Again, we didn't find much locally within the state or the region, but we did find quite a bit nationally. Um, cities did different where they did require the DOT inspection or some type of an inspection. Um, some would write their own things up, what they would want to see in that inspection. Um, some cities um, would have the haulers pay the city to have their fleet division um, actually do the inspection. Uh, we looked at this and it was, we, we looked at prices and it was anywhere from 75 to $150 per inspection. Um, so we chose to go this route. Okay, thank you. I do have a question. Councilor Erickson, yes, please. So my other question in regards to this one is what other trucks do, um, does, maybe this might not be for you, I don't know who it's for, but what other trucks are regulated through the city of Sioux Falls? Um, for example, are we regulating concrete mixers? Are we regulating uh, the big flatbeds that come and haul in sod to large projects? Are we regulating... Uh, all the lumber and wood that's brought in when you build a new house, because we've got some, and we've got a lot of building going on in this community. I mean, we've seen record growth in the last couple of years. And so we have a lot of movement of big vehicles throughout our roads, not just garbage haulers, but we have a lot of other ones. And by no means am I suggesting that we regulate all of those vehicles either. I'm just curious, what else do we regulate? Um, at one time we did taxis and I believe we deregulated that when we talked about Uber. So that's my question. Uh, I cannot answer yes or no on that. Um, I don't, Diane, if you can answer that. That question, And a follow-up email to the council that, would be great. I would be curious as far as kind of just a generalization of what else we require for regulation because like I said, we've got a lot of big trucks moving on our streets. Yeah. I don't want to just single out a garbage hauler and then nobody else has to follow those rules. So that's just my concern with that. The state DOT does require, if your vehicle's over 26,000 pounds gross volume weight, that you would have a DOT inspection conforming to the... the I'm sorry for my ignorance, but these vehicles would not meet those standards then to have to be... Uh, we looked at probably half or more already are over that 26,000. They're already receiving or getting an inspection. Okay. But we do not, the landfill does not see that inspection currently. So it just really be, sh I'm sorry. Oh, good job. Is I, it I didn't know that either. Is it just really sharing the information? So for example, I mean, we've got haulers of all sizes here from a two guy truck to a, you know, 30, 40 vehicle garbage hauler that those larger ones, they're already getting it. So for example, I know there was a gentleman from Novak here. If he's already get, giving, getting them, excuse me, it would just be a matter of sharing those with you. That's correct. Yep. During once they apply for their license, they would just have to prove that they had that inspection completed. You're not saying it has to be done through XYZ company. It just has to be done and given. Nope. It just has to conform to the DOT standards. Thank you. Hmm. I learned something too. Good job. What's Diane, you uh, do you have a different answer than Dustin gave? I thought he gave a pretty good answer. <laughs> I'll be consistent with Dustin. Thank you. Uh, I don't, just, don't repeat what he said. If it's I a different answer, I won't. All right. I just wanted to go back to this issue of uh, what other trucks are required to have the vehicle inspections. The reason vehicle inspections are required, we're asking for them to be required here, is these trucks are providing a public service to the citizens of Sioux Falls as licensed under the auspices of Public Works. So we have some responsibility to make sure that those trucks are, provide, are operating correctly within the streets of the city. And that's different from a completely private business. Thank you. 
Very good. I learned something there too. Yes. Diane, uh, if you don't mind, so do city, do city of Sioux Falls trucks have to be, uh, have to follow the same procedures? The city owned trucks? Yes. They are, they're routinely inspected. I don't know. Odds uh, from the gallery back there. there. Mark. Thank you. And could you, could you answer also if like tree, uh, to be an arborist, you have to be licensed with the city. So do arborists have to be inspected because they've got boom carts and they've got all those kind of things. Uh, good evening, Mark Cotter with the Thanks, Office Mark. of Public Works. I can speak for public works trucks and our fleet division goes through the DOT inspection process with our, with our trucks because they're also providing a public service. They are going through the neighborhoods and we wanna make sure that safe trucks are rolling through these neighborhoods. Good I job, can't Mark. speak to the uh, arborists. Diane, next week, could you come back with the uh, answer to Councillor Erickson's question about the arborists, please? Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, Council Vice Chair Kiley. Um, and it's a question along the inspection and the, DO, the, the vehicles that are subject to DOT inspection based on weight, are they also given a 30-day grace period? Can they use those or do they have to have the inspection prior to use? That I'm not sure of. Uh, that is that is just an aspect of it that's still coming from a, a safety background if we're going to do it you know it, it's still confusing to me as to why it wouldn't be in place day one instead of a 30-day period uh, I guess it's different if all vehicles were purchased brand new but that's probably not going to be the case and um, and as, as Tom had mentioned previously there is uh, a benefit to having a vehicle inspection as well too that they would realize uh, it, it helps to identify things that are deficient and, and gives them also the incentive to keep their equipment in, in top-notch shape as well yeah if I can just add to that uh, we do have a lot of haulers that uh, do run nationwide and there is times where a truck will go down and they have to bring a truck in from say Colorado and it has to be next next day and they got to get they got to get uh, garbage picked up so that's why we included that 30-day grace period. Uh, thank you. Councilor Urbanbach? Oh. I just want to go back for a moment to those trucks that, um, that, are, that are in the neighborhoods for various reasons. The thing that you have to remember for those of us that are not living in newer neighborhoods where there's construction all the time, it's a big deal to get a big truck in, a truck full of lumber or whatever to a central district neighborhood. It's not a big deal to get a garbage truck in there. We'll get them every single day, two or three or four different companies. So this is one of those pieces that I think we need to take that into account, that our neighborhoods are different. We really do need to be at a point where we are doing these inspections on all of those trucks. Uh, this, is, this one in particular is one I support wholeheartedly that we do this. So that's my perspective. And I, I was also, I would appreciate knowing about what our mandates are for the tree trimming vehicles and also like construction like Merle and Roy when they're, they're doing work for the city, are they being required to have the same inspections? We'll have and, an answer for you. Uh, yeah, that'd yep. be great. Sure. Councilor, thank you. Would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Monday, October 17th for item number six? So moved. Second, Selberg. Councilor Chair, thank you. Councilor Selberg, thank you for seconding, seconding that. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Item 7. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 57, Garbage and Recycling, Subchapter Commercial Haulers of the Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to insurance and financial assurance requirements. Diane? Good evening. My name is Diane Best, and I'm appearing on behalf of the Public Works Department. Uh, this particular ordinance involves two items pertaining to risk associated with, with uh, garbage haulers. First off, insurance, the insurance requirement would just bring the insurance up to date and make it consistent with other insurance coverages required across the city, both for its contractors and for uh, other licensees. Uh, that's, to my knowledge, not a very controversial item because most of the haulers, if not all of the haulers, already carry uh, this, all these types of insurance. Also, uh, 
I'm here to talk to you about the financial assurance requirement, which as you know has uh, some objection, but I'll try to uh, try to be concise regarding this proposal. Uh, the tools for landfill collection include communications with our customers, the haulers, and uh, we do communicate frequently, and we, and we have communicated uh, several times with them concerning these proposed ordinances. We also communicate with them regarding billing practices. Um, another tool is to manage collections when they get past due. We need to uh, uh, get a hold of them and talk to them and get the money collected. But of course, an important tool is good ordinances. And at the present time, we do have a good ordinance that provides that once uh, haulers are invoiced and if they're past due 60 days on that invoice, that they can no longer maintain a charge account at the landfill. So that's already in city ordinance. What we're here for today is the 90-day gap. Charges are incurred for up to 60 days and then for uh, or excuse me, charges are incurred for up to 30 days, they're invoiced, and then for 60 days after that, um, they can be passed due before they're actually, the charge account is actually uh, stopped at the landfill. So there's a 90-day gap. The proposal would provide for financial assurance in the form of a bond, escrow, or letter of credit the amounts would be $5,000, which, by the way, costs about $100 or $200 for that bond for $5,000, not $1,500, as you've heard here or has been reported in the media. So $5,000 on the low end, or three months average charges, whichever is greater. And as, uh, as you're aware, there are, that would be varying amounts for the varying haulers. These three types of financial assurance are similar to the financial assurance that is required for developers. Developers guarantee when they complete a subdivision that they will complete the streets, the curb and gutter, the lighting, and other public improvements in the developments. If they, they have to post a bond, letter of credit, or escrow guaranteeing they will complete those improvements. If they don't, the city engineer has authority to go ahead and collect from the bond or <coughs> creditor escrow. Also, the city has other bond requirements for liquid waste haulers, which is a $25,000 bond, and that includes also, in, as part of that, that includes a payment of city fees. Residential contractors, an individual res residential contractor in the city, even if they build one house, has to post a $20,000 <coughs> $20, dollar bond with the city. Uh, and as part of that, that includes payment of fees, including landfill fees. So bonds are, this is nothing new here. It's just that the charge accounts here are bigger and they require, and they have not been required before. Now, having said all this, all the haulers have charge accounts. If they choose not to maintain a charge account at the landfill, that's their business. They do not have to then file any financial assur assurance. They can pay as they go. As indicated, this is to provide for that 90 days coverage. Today, all the haulers, as of today and this month, all haulers have paid their invoices within the 60 days. Now, what do I mean by that? Are they current? What I mean is some are between 30 and 60 days past due, which means they have the 30 days accrued invoice, 30 days past due on the invoice, and they're between 30 and 60. Some have run up, some run up to 60 days more frequently than others, that's undeniable. But again, the city is, when they get to that 60 days, requiring them to pay cash only at the landfill and that, um, that tool is already in place. Uh, there are, uh, in response to 
this particular issue and questions uh, raised during the information of last week. Uh, there are 14 different haulers that have been at the 30-day mark at least once in the past three years. So that's the 30 to 60 day. They've been at least the 30 days. And then they've paid the finance charges accordingly and been subject to uh, collections efforts. In the past 12 months, at least three haulers have received notices that they will be converted to cash at the landfill. There, two years ago, there were five haulers that were more than 90, day past, 90 days past due, and that resulted in fairly aggressive collection efforts. And as, uh, as you're aware, one of those did result in court action. And we are working aggressively to prevent that kind of slippage again. And this is not in reaction or punishment to the kind of issue that occurred before that resulted in court action. It's in response to reviewing the practices at the landfill and determining that it's prudent to avoid that 90 days risk. Now, I'll, uh, I know there were questions before about the bond, the bond premium fees, so I'll just go into that real briefly. The price of a bond is generally 2% if a purchaser has good credit. So the premium on the minimum bond, $100 to $200, that's a minimum premium for a small bond of $5,000. The three-month bond, there's, I was searching for a way to characterize this, to explain it to the council without um, explaining how much each hauler would have to pay or um, discouraging any information on their market share. But bottom line, the total fees charged to haulers in a three-month period at the landfill is $1.8 million. Okay, so that's, that's the city's risk. Now, when you consider there should be 52,000 accounts in Sioux Falls, there are 52,000 utility billing accounts. So just for purposes of characterizing this, it's assumed there are 52,000 landfill, landfill customers for these haulers, okay? And as a rough estimate, there are at least another 4,000 accounts in the remainder of the five county area. And by these accounts, I mean all customers of these various haulers. So a modest estimate of the haulers' total number of accounts is 56,000 accounts, okay? So they're servicing 56,000 accounts or more, and they uh, have charges over a three-month period of $1.8 million. 2% of that $1.8 million is $36,000. So $36,000 premium, basically, to be shared among all of the haulers based on each of the haulers' proportion of their doing business. The bond costs, if applied to each of those 56,000 accounts evenly, if the haulers choose to increase their rates to pay for a bond, would be 64 cents per year. 64 cents per year per customer of the hauler if they choose to increase their rates and if they choose to purchase a bond. As indicated, they could also do, again, a, a irrevocable letter of credit or they could do an escrow account or they could pay as you go. So that's basically designed just to answer that piece about what it costs for a bond and, and what our total risk is. So uh, again, we are asking you to set a second reading for this matter at the same time as the prior two items. Uh, Councilor Silbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're Thank welcome. you, Diane. That's a lot of numbers to chew on. Um, now, were these alternatives, were they brought about as a result of a study as well, like the past two issues we talked about, other communities were doing this? We did look at what other communities are doing, and we found that there was a wide variety within various communities. A number of communities provide their own municipal solid waste service. So it would, when you start looking at our local area, 
Uh, you, you don't run into a lot of information on it. I can tell you that PEER, which of course is much smaller, requires financial assurance for $5,000 minimum or four months estimated fees. And then um, Fargo provides its own service. Uh, some of the other smaller communities would just charge a straight $5,000 bond. Norfolk, Nebraska, for example, Litchfield, Minnesota, charges a $20,000 bond. Um, so they require specific to bonds. Uh, so then we went and looked across the country at some other ideas of ways to handle the financial assurance. And one way that's done in several municipalities is to, is to basically provide 30 days credit. If the bill isn't paid, they never receive, uh, they're never extended credit again. So it's a one shot, one chance deal. Um, we looked at one city in, in uh, Connecticut. It requires either pay as you go accounts or bond, letter of credit, cash, cashier's check for two months waste charges. And it all depends on what their collection practices are. Um, Another one requires uh, two months tipping fee, cash deposit, or a bond. So those are the kinds of things, but you know, the, the smaller the bond is, the shorter the period until you actually would uh, uh, close their charge account. That was kind of my question, how many different alternatives were there out there? Because I mean, how extensive has the lack of pay been in this industry with our city? Has it been a chronic problem from What I can tell you is that during the two-year period, we have had five haulers that were more than 90 days past due. One resulted in court action, as you're aware. Uh, the others did work out compliance plans, and they are they paid those past due amounts. So we've had good ultimate collection practices. Uh, we, we're, we're working fairly aggressive in order to get those accounts down. Uh, as far as the lo total losses incurred by the city previous to the last two years, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Okay, because the only thing, like, it's just kind of hard to argue with some of these gentlemen. I'm sorry, can no, I say it's one more right, thing? Sir. Um, it's hard to argue, you know, with some of the point of view of these gentlemen and businessmen who are here and have been good customers for years. You know, if I'm looking at it from a personal point of view, if I'm a a member of with American Express and I've been spending a pretty good amount of money for, with them for years and have terrific credit and about seven years down the road all of a sudden I get a notice that next year to continue doing business with them I give them five thousand dollars I know it's not apples to apples but it's just I guess that's just kind of why I'm asking what alternatives we looked at it's hard to kind of listen to their story and argue with that right. so what, what I would look at is the fact that for years they ran charge accounts with without providing any guarantee, deposit, letter of credit, and so forth, and the city was very lucky. Um, but the time to get the letter of credit, the escrow, or the bond in place is the time when the companies are able to provide that. And so um, we wouldn't want to say, we have no problem now, let's revisit this in three years, and by then we've already seen three years of somebody was bought out by a parent company, and the, they were by another company, and they defaulted, or somebody else went bankrupt. Let's avoid these issues before they occur. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I'm thinking. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Mark, I don't like this one. Councilor Starr. Um, Diane, when I'm taking a look at the proposed ordinance, I guess I'm just a little bit confused about the proof of insurance part that we're striking from the current ordinance and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, when we took out the, we're just saying that they have to show proof of insurance and then right. we're taking out all the requirements of what that proof would entail. Right. Um, as it currently sits, there are two insurance provisions uh, 
that apply to, under this same chapter 57 on, um, on waste. And one provision refers to greater insurance than the other provision. The one that has the greater insurance applies to um, medical waste, transfer stations, and, and recycling facilities. Sure. Those three entities had a greater insurance requirement than actually the municipal solid waste and C&D haulers. So what this does is just repeals the one that applies to medical, or excuse me, that applies to municipal solid waste and C&D haulers. Okay. It just repeals it and refers back to the other ordinance. So now you have one ordinance that applies to all of them for insurance. So if we need to update insurance requirements in the future, we'll have one of them, it's uniform. But it's probably a higher amount that, so basically for the C&D haulers and for this group, the actual minimums are gonna go up of what we're requiring? There's a greater stated amount of insurance in the ordinance, but the requirements are, like for general liability, it's a million dollars per occurrence and $2 million aggregate which is a very uniform across the board requirement for insurance for vendors with the city. And it's uh, frankly, when you look at, I looked at it at the last licensing cycle and, mo and most if not all of them already carried the requisite insurance. And is there it, has been no objection from the haulers. Um, if I may, then it, is it different from the requirements that the state, are, are we at the same level as the state minimum um, insurance requirements. I know as an individual there are state minimums. Are there state minimums in place? I mean, are we adding an extra layer here that we're asking for a higher limit than what the state would require or the state, as part of doing? The state doesn't have a commercial general liability minimum, minimum for these particular businesses as such. Uh, Obviously, auto liability, there has to be coverage, and workers' comp, there has to be coverage, and the cities uh, would be consistent with the state's requirements. Thank you. Council Chair Rolfing. Yes, um, oh. I'm hearing some um, questions, some more questions, and things that are coming up on this, and uh, maybe possible other solutions, that kind of thing, and I'm wondering if it might not be a good idea to take a look at uh, delaying this for another week or two so that we can get some other options on the table and maybe discuss this further with you, Diane, and, uh, and some of the haulers maybe, and, and uh, come up with a, a solution that may look exactly the same or it may look different. Uh, but I guess I would like to um, put off the second reading on this ordinance to, um, let's see, our 17th, uh, let's the first one in November, how would that be? Or December. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to take care of that. If we're doing the other two, we probably need to get this done. Uh, what's the first uh, week and first meeting in November? November 1st? Or the 4th? November 1. November 1. I would uh, make a motion that we uh, set the hearing uh, uh, hearing and second reading for Mon or Tuesday, uh, November November 4th at uh, 7 p.m. here in the City Hall. November 1st. Second. November, November 1st. 1st, I'm sorry, yes. Is there a second? A second. Councilor er Erickson? I, I did second it, but I have a couple questions because here's my concern is that we kick the can down the road and they're in limbo again for three, four weeks <laughs> that if we can bring it back sooner and just get it done with, maybe it's not doing it at all. So my question is, is I know that they're there are these credit accounts. So what happens if they are 30 days late and you just say, okay, no more credit account, or we mandate that they have to be on ACH. I know that the software currently does not provide for it out at the landfill, but we've got to figure out something and get with the times to allow ACH. I mean, you can do it with Sioux Falls Utilities that we've got to come up with a way to get ACH. And so, hey, if you're gonna be a hauler, you have to be on ACH, so it automatically comes out. If you default, something triggers to where 
your license is gone. Or There's got to be a different way. I get that you don't want 90 days of risk out there. I get that. And most of these people understand that. I think probably all of them understand that. But these probably aren't the ones that are delinquent either. And so maybe they are. I don't know. So the concerns with that is, is how can we get them up to date quickly without that 90-day risk and have some sort of trigger point in there as well? I mean, do we charge interest? Do we have late fees? What are we already doing that we can just strengthen without penalizing those that are in good graces already with the city? I think that's the big concern, are the ones that are paying in good graces. So, I mean, yeah, I second it, but I, I just as soon just remove this and let's just get it gone and we can bring it up with the haulers in mind again. I'm happy to bring it to public services and, and discuss it there in more detail if need be um, to our committee you know, with the, the approval of the council, but I say we just vote it down today and start over. Councilor Erickson, I think that uh, that's just fine. And uh, um, so we've got a, we've right now have, there, there, council, there's a couple of options. Uh, thank you. One is Councilor Chair Rolfing talked about delaying this to November 1. Uh, Councilor Erickson's not made a motion yet because we have to now vote on this one. But the other one is just don't set a second reading, uh, which is would kind of kill it for now. Uh, I have to bite my tongue. I, I know what I would like you to do. Um, uh, uh, I tried to relay that to Councilor Rolfing with, without telling you what to do. So why don't we, Councilor Erickson? If I can just make a suggestion to my fellow colleagues here is to vote no on the amendment. We go back to the main motion and we all vote again. We make a motion to move to approve for the second reading and then we all vote. Very I would good. encourage you to vote no. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Let's vote sense. on the first one. Uh, that was to delay the second reading till November 1st. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? No. Staley? No. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? No. Rolfing? I'm going to say yes. Selberg? No. Very good. Mr. And Mayor, move, yeah. move to approve uh, to set the, the reading um, of the ordinance. Thank you. Second? Is there a second? And then vote down. Second, Selberg. Thank you, Council. Uh, roll call vote, please. No. Oh. Do we get discussion? Further yeah. Discussion. Uh, Anytime there's a motion, we got to have <clears throat> Okay. As long as it's not repetitive, let's not repeat the same thing that we just heard, because uh, I, I think we've had plenty of good discussion on it. Thank well, you. Councilor Staley. Thank you. Well, what I wanted to say is that I think that having a, something in place where we would, this assurity bond isn't such, is, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm saying use that for those companies that have been very delinquent, and, and, and then let the other companies continue on the, the way they have been because I've talked with some of these handlers and I think they really care about doing a good job and I agree with the sentiments I've heard from my colleagues here that we may not have a problem that needs to be fixed. So that's, thank you. Very good, it's fairly repetitive comments. Uh, any other things that's unique? Uh, Councilor uh, Chair Rolfing. I, um, while I agree with everything that's been said here, my, my reason for putting a stop date on this of, of December 1st was we have two weeks in to get it done or three weeks to get it done. Um, rather than just say, hey, we're going to take care of this somewhere down the line. I, I worry that that won't get done and that we'll just forget it. Um, that can't happen. So um, please make sure that you uh, uh, stay on this and, and um, we, we get it done in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Councilor, okay. Councilor Buck. You've passed sorry. me over twice this no, evening. Sorry, Mr. sorry, sorry. <laughs> Councilor Buck. I don't think so, but this is the first time, but thank you. Councilor Buck. I need to respectfully disagree with Councilor Rolfing because we're at a point where I don't believe that city staff has tried the, the opportunities that Councilor Erickson has pointed out. We know that we have software that can do far more than what we're using it for. We're not taking the opportunities that we are and we're just putting the burden on these haulers. And I don't think that we have to be responsible for providing you know, a, another date for them for staff to meet. We can kill this now, and they can bring it back if it's such a big deal, but I think they need to take that opportunity to use the software the way that it will work. Again, I think that was fairly repetitive. My apologies. Don't, and I, I don't just, appreciate your comments just, on the way that we're just trying the to meeting, be, Mr. Just, Mayor. Like, they're repetitive comments. A roll call, please. Just to be clear, Mr. Mayor, this is for Monday, October 17th. Yes, it's for Monday, October 2nd, 
uh, 17th to move to a second reading. A no vote would basically kill it. For now. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? No. Staley? No. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Kiley? No. Neitzert? No. Rolfing? No. Selberg? No. Very good. That is failed, zero to eight. Item nine. All right, item eight, sorry, item eight. First reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by amending chapter 111 alcoholic beverages by creating an official city waiting list of off sale liquor license applicants. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. The number of off sale liquor licenses the city can issue is limited by state law at 104 licenses. This number is based off the 2010 census data. We can recalculate that um, when the 2020 census data is, is received. To date, I have received at least three inquiries for off-sale liquor licenses, so I am before you tonight proposing this ordinance. This proposed ordinance creates a waiting list for off-sale liquor applicants. <coughs> Anyone interested will be asked to submit a waiting list application along with a $50 non-refundable fee. The names will be drawn by lot to determine their place on the list, and when a license becomes available, it will be offered to the first name on the list. The non-refundable fee will be applied to the cost of the license when it is purchased, and the cost to purchase an off-sale liquor license is $500. This section is very similar, similar to the process that is outlined for the on-sale liquor license waiting list. My hope tonight is that this proposed ordinance will be scheduled for second reading and receive your approval on October 17th. This would give me the time to develop the waiting list before the end of the year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jamie, thank you. Uh, Councilor Neisert. Are, we're currently out of off-sale licenses? We are, yes. All 104 have been issued. So another retail business opens in the city of Sioux Falls and they can't get a license? Correct. Okay. Not for, not for packaged liquor. They could get packaged beer because we have those available. Those can, are unlimited. Can you just explain the distinction? What Packaged uh, liquor allows a business to sell beer, wine, and spirits, and packaged beer obviously would only allow them to sell packaged malt-based beverages. There is also a, a license that allows packaged malt with South Dakota farm wineries, and those are wines that are, that are um, manufactured in South Dakota only. So in lay terms, I couldn't get one to sell beer and hard liquor? Correct. Okay, thank you. Good job, Councillor. Councillor Buck, did you have a comment? Uh, Councillor Starr. Um, yes, Jamie. Um, what happens, um, there are provisions in the proposed ordinance, obviously, if a conditional use permit is required in the timeline. Um, if you, a person was at the top of the list, and they chose not to use it, do they just turn it back or are they able to transfer it to someone else um, as part of the process? Well, right now, um, I believe how it's outlined is that they could ha they'd have a couple of choices. If they, if they were offered the license and didn't want it, they could say, no, nope, I don't want it right now, I'll put my name to the bottom of the list, or they could say, take my name off the list, but typically it's just they would go to the bottom and it, I would offer it to the next there person on the list. There wouldn't be an opportunity to, say, sell it or transfer it to another business or use it one... You know what I'm trying to right. avoid in this right. this process. Yeah, no, I their, guess, in a, their name would go to the bottom of the list then if they just. So there's no ability to transfer no. to someone else or sell that opportunity. Well, they could accept the license um, as long as they had a, a place of business that that would allow us to for them to use the license, and then they could very shortly thereafter transfer it. Yes, they could, they but could they would have to have a place to put that license and use it <coughs> in the meantime. Councilor Starr, you're not? I'm done. Very I'm good. Thank you, Thank Councilor Mott. So Councilor Starr couldn't go buy this license and speculate then with it and sell it at a profit or anything like that. It has to be, I ha would, he would have to create a business, have a place to put it, an address and everything, right? That is correct. Is that where you're headed? You no, know, that, that's exactly. The whole exactly. speculating that's, thing? Yep, exactly. For $50, do you take a right? shot at exactly. uh, being in line, How whether much? it's 250 or whatever the number is for mm -hmm. um, an on sale as well. So yeah. mm -hmm. that's where I was trying to... Thank you for clarifying. Councilors, great job. Would anybody want to set a date of hearing, a second reading for Monday, October 17th for item number eight? So moved. 
Councillor Erickson's made that. Councillor Starr seconded. Thank you both. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Item 9. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations, park and recreations, $684,000. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, this is a supplemental appropriation that would allow us to accept donations from two of our partners for two separate projects within our park system. Uh, the first one is uh, for $550,000 for uh, donations received by the zoo that would go towards the brown bear exhibit. Uh, the supplemental appropriation would allow, give us the spending authorization to be able to use their donated funds uh, towards that project. And then we, uh, per our agreement with the uh, Friends of Levitt Shell Sioux Falls, we also, uh, they're also obligated to pay half of the design for Falls Park West Levitt Shell improvements. And so uh, the $134,000 uh, would provide for us to be able to again use their donated funds towards those projects. In total, uh, it's uh, $684,000 between the two projects. So with that, we'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Don. Appreciate that. Councilor, is any questions? Yes, Councilor Neitzert. Who owns the ground and the buildings at the zoo? The city? The city does, yes. That's correct. How about the uh, animals and the, and the uh, taxidermy? Is that the yeah, zoo? Elizabeth Whaley society? is here uh, with uh, the Curious. executive director of the Zoo Society, and it would be a great question for Elizabeth to answer. Elizabeth, Councillor Neitzert um, asked, who owns the animals and who owns the taxidermy um, animals? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Whaley, uh, President and CEO of the Great Plains Zoo. So a way to think about the zoo city partnership is that we live on city land in city buildings and the city of Sioux, Paul, Sioux Falls pays the private nonprofit uh, about 31% of our operating budget to care for those buildings and to care for those grounds. The living, breathing part of the zoo, the animals, the employees, uh, that is the private nonprofit. Very good, thank you. And that includes the taxidermy. The no. taxidermy, we take care of that for you, but that of course is part of the assets of the zoo. So we so, own the... So the taxidermy collection, I believe, is the city's. Okay, oh, okay. very good. Council Vice Chair Kylie. Well, first of all, my thanks to the Zoological Society for their donation to enable the brown bears to live in a kinder environment. And also to the Levitt Foundation, too, for their effort uh, relating to the Levitt band shell that will be that soon in our future. And I'd like to set uh, a date of hearing and second reading for Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m. Second, Erpenbach. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Councilor Chair, Vice Chair Kiley made that motion. Second by Councilor Erpenbach. Uh, Councilor Neisert. Yeah, I, I guess um, since Ms. Whaley's here, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that as, as somebody with a, a young daughter in the last handful of years, the transformation that's been going on at the zoo, it's really incredible. So um, it, it, it's really great. I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just to give you a little context on the brown bear exhibit, the city has $253,000 in the CIP for this project. The project now is at $2.4 million to renovate that brown bear exhibit that's part of the original 1963 footprint of the zoo, hasn't been renovated since the mid-1980s. So we're very pleased to have all of these private partners allowing for that brown bear exhibit to be rehabilitated and to really be transformative for our zoo. So thank you for bringing your daughter. We appreciate it. Very good. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 10. A resolution authorizing the Sioux Falls Central Services mm -hmm. Department to gift a scanner copier to Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Welcome. <clears throat> Hello, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lori Soule, and I am the GIS Manager in the GIS Department under Central Services. The GIS Office has recently replaced our 10-year-old wide format scanner with an updated model. 
We reached out to our colleagues at the Minnehaha County GIS office to see if they could make use of the scanner and they replied that yes, they could put it to good use down there. So this gift to Minnehaha County would include the 44 inch wide format scanner and its software. Lori, thank you. Did anybody want to speak to this item in the audience? Councilors? Move to approve NYSERT. Second or Muck. Councilor Neitzert uh, would like to donate this and sounds like Councilor Muck would too. With that second, a roll call vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Silberg? Yes. Thank you, Council. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 11. A resolution adopting the Shape Sioux Falls 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Good evening, Council Mayor. Albert Schmidt, pl uh, Urban Planner. Thank you. Uh, building Services and Planning. So we came forward in the informational for this one earlier. We had some really good comments. We made some uh, tweaks to the mapping, so nothing's really, the data that we're presenting isn't really changed, just how we're presenting it to you has changed a little bit. So just a quick little background for you. Um, South Dakota Codified Law is kind of where the requirement for comprehensive plan comes into place. Uh, and typically we adopt a new one every 10 to 15 years, and then we do an update uh, every four to eight years or so. Uh, the current one, Shapes Who Falls 2035, was adopted in 2009, and then we adopted a new zoning ordinance, Shape Places, so very similar names there, uh, but that was adopted by public vote in 2014. And so the comprehensive plan was used to help kind of mold that zoning ordinance, but it is a separate document from it. Uh, so the goals remain the same as they were originally. Uh, there's three main goals here, effective management of growth, planning neighborhoods, land use, urban form, and improve the sustainability of community. Um, the main updates that we did here are demographics and kind of updating some of our maps to reflect what's actually out there. So the timeline that we had going on here, we had public input on the open houses in May, <clears throat> and then we did our informational at City Council in September, then we took it to Planning Commission on October 5th. They recommended for approval. And then we have it tonight for approval for the City of Sioux Falls. And then tomorrow night, I go down to Canton to do the joint planning and zoning uh, meeting to do a recommendation for that side, but for the area outside of the City of Sioux Falls. I'll have the last slide kind of indicate and show these differences for you. And then we're going to go to Mayaha for an informational. Then we'll go to the joint one with Mayaha. And then we're gonna, still planning on doing a elected officials meeting between all three entities in one meeting instead of doing two meetings on November 22nd. And then after all that fun is done, we're gonna come back and because you're adopting the plan, then we'll do an ordinance amendment after the fact to actually change the ordinance um, <coughs> references to the plan. So you'll see it one more time, but it'll just be the ordinance amendment side of it. All right, so the numbers didn't really change, so I'll kind of go a little quickly for you here, but Generally speaking, the population updates decreased our population estimates due to the recession. So you saw this one before, 2035 numbers when compared between the previous plan and the new one, lowered down from 270,000 to 233. The future land use map, we heard the comments. We took two maps into one this time. And so I'm gonna go to the next one here, made them a little bigger for you. So the one on the left is the 2035 comprehensive plan map. And the one on the right is our new proposed one for the 2040. As you can see, we've tried to incorporate a little different uh, coloring pattern that hopefully should be a little more pleasing. We also put in uh, abbreviations to help identify them a little better. We've also indicated uh, a little bit more on the street uh, corridors, if you will, like Minnesota 41st and those kind of developments. And so this includes existing areas and new proposed areas. So a lot of information on the map there. Um, the growth management plan is still the same as it was before. So it kind of shows our new tier one, tier two, kind of where we're going to grow, when we're going to grow there. Um, and then this is our new one here. So what we're asking for tonight is approval of the plan uh, for the area shown as CSU Falls and A, which is kind of that brown area. So that's really the area tonight we're voting on. And then November 22nd, if that meeting is held at the same exact time, you'll get the pleasure of voting on B and C as well. So with that, I would take any questions you may have for this fantastic document. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before I go to the council, did anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Councilors, 
Councillor Nicer. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. The first, at 12th and TLS Road, you're depicting now a community employment center. Can you just give us a flavor of what somebody would expect out there? Sure. Um, let me, I prepared some stuff for you that you might kind of see. Um, when we talk about what a community employment center, for instance, is, that I find the map is blue, it's about 60 to 120 acres, of uh, which 50% or less is going to be commercial. Um, a good example of that is like 26th and Marion. So when you go community center, um, this is an example I like to point out to you guys. It's adjacent to a regional, so it kind of blends a little bit. But when you think about just the 26th and Marion area, it kind of gives you a rough idea of what we're talking when we're talking community employment center. Do, do you have these online? This would be, is this on the Shape Sioux Falls page? Not yet. I just created it today. This would be guys. wonderful to have a... A pictorial it's 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 so hard to these dots don't mean anything to anybody including myself so this would be great sure I can definitely. Um, and then the other thing looking at the compatibility chart the famous you know <laughs> yeah. so it looks like you've eliminated the 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 whole units thing yeah remember it used to be less than 12 and 12 to 24 yeah, and we, now sorry I, yeah so so now um, uh, when you're looking what dictates the compatibility now? Simply looking at form, zoning districts? I mean, because you're not looking, we don't have this units debate anymore. Well, yeah, and so the real reason for taking out the units is when we actually adopted and drafted the zoning ordinance itself, the densities weren't taken to, they weren't utilized in the new zoning ordinance. And so when we first drafted 2035, we had a zoning ordinance that did utilize densities. And a lot of times people had a hard time really intrinsically like thinking about what does density really mean when you say more than 12 units what do I vision when I think of a density of more than 12 units per acre um, so we changed that when we wrote the ordinance for zoning and so now with this update we're just changing that to reflect the zoning ordinance that actually got adopted and so we just kind of removed those um, and took it out and if you want I do I can I do have a copy of the full version here if you're interested in that one but yeah so the whole chart stayed the same we just made minor tweaks to removing the densities and then updating the name to more accurately reflect what the residential ones were and, and, the, and you just hit my last point which was I appreciate that you changed the naming because as an example during uh, one of the last debates of a big development on the east side that was proposed one of the things when you talk to uh, the residents was as they're looking at this document um, low density apartments were also high density residential. And so you got into this, it, it got very confusing. It, it, you're turning these different, what is it high density? Is it low density? And then they couldn't figure out what the chart meant. And I think it's a little easier now that says, I think it's as an apartment residential and single family residential. Yes. Something we can all grasp. So thank you. Absolutely. Councilor, thank you. Folks, uh, is that it? Very good. I. Uh, would it, we, do we have a motion? No, sir. Thank you. Move I'll to move approve. to approve. Second, Urban Bach. Councilor Bach, you were first. I'm going to let you be first. Councilor Urban Bach made the motion, seconded by Councilor Chair Rolfing. Thank you. A uh, roll call, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Urban Bach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Councilor, thank you. Uh, before we adjourn this meeting, I do want to remind the Council this city council, as well as anybody else who's interested in city council meetings, that next week's meeting is on Monday instead of Tuesday. It's on the 17th um, versus the 18th. So I just want to make you all aware of that. Um, Councilor, we'll see you next Monday. Uh, if there is no other discussion, can I get a motion to adjourn? So. Council Chair, thank you. Second, Star. Council Vice Chair and Council Star, thank you. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned to Falls. Make it a great, great night.